memorial lecture in honour of William Bunger. And since his work is perhaps not as well known as it, as it should be, uh, and by way of giving some context to today's event, um, I thought it might be useful just to say a few words about the man himself. Um, he's probably best known for his book, Fitzgerald, Geography of a Revolution, which was published in 1971. And it certainly was one of the chief inspirations to us in setting up uh, Living Maps. In the book, he makes an important distinction between what he calls skeletal maps, maps which visualize statistical information, and life maps, maps that tell stories in a way that brings this data to human life. So, in his view, the first kind of map is static, provides a sort of fixed framing of social reality, whereas the second, the life maps, show that reality in movement. And Bunger thought that both kinds of cartography are necessary, complementing one another. So you have the scientific mapping of geopolitics of urban life and its structural and spatial inequalities, and then that was, in a sense, guaranteed, its authenticity was guaranteed through personal geographies through which those inequalities are experienced and sometimes resisted. And today, that distinction between the visualisation of big quantitative data sets generated through algorithmic cartograms, that kind of mapping, and the deep narrative mapping that's created by qualitative methods of scenography and oral testimony, uh, that tension, if you like, has intensified. And so too, as recent events in Kensington and Chelsea have shown all too clearly, have those inequalities of race and class which Bunga was so concerned to expose. Now, he be- I think the important thing to understand about, about uh, William Bunga is that he belonged to a generation of intellectuals who believed in scientific socialism as offering a higher form of rationality in the service of social justice. In fact, he was trained as a quantitative geographer, uh, like David Harvey, in fact. And unlike David Harvey, he thought that mathematical topology could put geography at last on a proper scientific footing. In the 1960s, while teaching in Detroit, he became disillusioned with the academy, became an activist against the Vietnam War, supported the student movement, alienated his fellow academics by his outspoken views, got fired from his university job, and became involved in community campaigns against the endemic racism of Detroit's educational system housing policies and city governments. As a result of that, he was blacklisted, couldn't get a job in any American university, and so in the early 1970s, he moved to Canada, where he remained for most of his life. He died in 2013. I think it's perhaps worth noting that he he did remain a lifelong communist. He he was for a time elected representative of the Parti Communiste Quebecois. But he was a dissident communist who believed in the value of popular and direct democracy rather than the saving power of the Vanguard Party. And it was from this vantage point of being strongly embedded in the struggle for the black and white working class community of Detroit that Bungate embarked on what he called an expeditionary geography that was to culminate in the publication of his book. Um, this is the front cover. And what's remarkable about this book, I think, is that it combines elements of oral history cultural geography, social cartography, visual ethnography, to provide a rich, multi-layered account of the past, present and future of a suburb of Detroit, which was undergoing rapid change, and had also been the centre of the uprising which marked the radicalisation of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Bungin not not only set out to capture the density and complexity of that local experience, he used it as a lens through which to focus and analyse the intersections of race and class in the unravelling of the great American dream. So the form of the book is that of an atlas, weaving together maps, graphs, photo montage, illustrations, landscape and portraiture, personal testimony, polemic and analysis, into a trenchant narrative of the life and death of a great American city, concentrating especially on the predicaments of its children and young people. And there's one, one of his maps here which is particularly is about that, which is trying to show uh, what happens to children's play spaces in the cities uh, when uh, transport uh, basically chops up the space and it confines them to ever narrower uh, uh, kinds of uh, areas in which to interact. Um, 
So the point about the book, I think, and why I think it's, it has a lot of lessons to teach us today, is that it ruthlessly cuts across ac academic boundaries. And it delighted in producing counterintuitive geographies that put in question our taken for granted assumptions about spatiality and what is near and far. My favourite example of this, uh, whoops, sorry, uh, <laughs> that's big on here, is uh, this one here, um, which shows that the Canadians uh, live uh, a lot uh, nearer to the United States than the people in the United States live to, uh, to, uh, in relation to Canada. And he had this kind of interest center of fun, fun of actually producing these maps which kind of unsettled uh, one's, in this case, sense of national boundaries as being something that's kind of fixed. Um, that people's uh, actual locations and mental maps will work quite differently. So for all these reasons, Bunga's pioneering work remains exemplary, although some of its concerns, I suppose, seem to inevitably belong to a bygone political era. Um, uh, but I've just fi finished by just showing just two of the maps that have become quite iconic, I suppose. Uh, this is a map which shows um, the accidents uh, in this area of Detroit, which basically are created by these, these are kind of rat runs of, 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 of people driving in from the, the white suburbs, the kind of white flight suburbs, into the centre of Detroit um, and without any sense that black lives matter. So these are actually, these dots are actually represent accidents to black children. Uh, and it, you know, it was by using uh, these sorts of maps backed by all sorts of other evidence that he was able to dramatise uh, the way in which racism worked uh, on, on the ground. So, um, I hope this also makes clear um, why in this second memorial lecture we've invited Ian Sinclair uh, to give this lecture. Since the 1960s, Ian has pioneered a unique form of expeditionary geography, setting out on foot to discover and traverse the more hidden lines of desire that have woven the urban fabric uh, beneath the surface scheme of rationalised planning and regeneration. And in exploring that fabric, he's brought to light a network of stories, memories, and imaginative encounters, if you like, the cities of a scene. In his writing, he characteristically takes a line of thought for a walk across many disciplines and indisciplines. In a single sentence or paragraph, we are taken seamlessly from personal anecdote to historical event, from literary allusion to poetic observation, in a pyrotechnic that captures the dizzling, diz dazzling complexity of city life itself. And, and also, like Wagner, I think he's refused to accommodate his vision to the political parties of the age. He still speaks from the edgelands he set out to explore with such panache. I think he's probably the only writer to be banned from publicly reading his work as a result of pressure from the Olympic Liberal Authorities, I don't know how someone said about that, who took exception to his polemic against the London 2012 Games. And actually, if you read Ghost Milk, um, if you do read it, um, you'll understand uh, why. Well, finally, in addition to honouring William Bunge, today's event kicks off a series of public lectures which Living Maps is organising over the next 12 months under the general rubric, Our Kind of Town. The series will accompany and inform the creation of a Citizen Atlas of London, a multi-layered online map made by a network of citizen mappers. Mappers who are concerned to envisage a new and alternative vision of what this great city can be as a place to work, live and play and the city for the many and not the few. We've circulated, I think, uh, when you came, if you've got the sleep that um, you've got some information about the lecture series, and you can for find more information about the Citizens Atlas project on the website, so I won't say more about that now. Except to stress that this project has been launched at a conjuncture when the future of London is precariously balanced between a renewal of its long history of struggle for democratic rights and social justice, or becoming an offshore, offshore tax haven and property investment portfolio for the rich, propped up by a low-wage, low-skill economy with a new help class to service their needs. So this is the second reason why we were delighted when Ian accepted our invitation to give this lecture. For he is a great chronicler of our kind of town, the deep matter of its subtle and not-so-subtle divisions, a celebrator of its often hidden affordances. He has charted in often surreal detail the turning of London's growth from west to east in the last few decades. And his new book, so I'm going to do the quote for it, uh, 
is, I think, out in September. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and I think it, it represents a, a, a summative account of this process of London's turning. And I think we're all very much looking forward to hear the latest, if hopefully not the last chapter, of his encounter with this city. So, to give the 2017 Bungay Memorial Lecture, please welcome Ian Sinclair. Thank you very much. I'm very, very grateful to Phil for having introduced me to this man and, and uh, thrown me into the context of giving this lecture. Uh, and I'm very happy with that. Uh, the only thing I'm not too sure about is how to pronounce his name. Um, Bunga, Bungay, Bungi, we'll, we, I may drift on and off the right pronunciation, but you know who I'm talking about. It's a bit like W.G. Siebold, Zebald, whatever. He, he, he is that kind of uh, figure and already begins to obsess me in a sense. What, what we've heard has made me um, rethink a question that's, that's been worrying at me for some time about this whole notion of the term psychogeography, which has begun to be a sort of uh, alternative tourism. Um, and I think that the terms of radical geography and expeditionary geography that we've heard floated tonight make a lot more sense in terms of what I'm doing. And those maps were, were particularly evocative and reminded me of some I'd seen made by um, young um, activist, uh, geographer, performer, poets in Amsterdam who had recorded um, with their own technologies, the movements of people in certain parts of the city, where they made almost a, a beautiful uh, abstractions of different coloured lines, that you were able to grasp through these images exactly how the city operated in the way that that, that map of the entry into Detroit took place. But I want to begin with this a phrase that, that is this sort of a idiocy that we, we hear all the time, is that there's a phrase, no worries. No problem at all. You know, this has become a kind of reflex thing, an Americanism like have a good day, have a great day, when you just bought something or you've had a cup of tea, uh, what are you going to do with the rest of your day? No worries, no worries, which implies very much the opposite. <laughs> Everything is worry. And I, I come back to the period of Bungie, um, to the poet Ed Dorn, and I, um, we're going to kind of come across him too. And the thing he said, the bottom line of that great degenerating power is bad times get worse. <coughs> if voting changed anything, it would be illegal. Um, and I, want, I, I, want, I want to vote. I, you know, I want to vote for, for where we are in the city. And I want something more than this version that we've seen recently of uh, these political entities that are like a bunch of scorpions in a bucket stinging each other and climbing on the corpses to get out to the light. As if the rest of it, the kind of things that could be mapped by these geographical schemes were unimportant. And there's a huge movement between the God's eye view of this sort of verticality the helicopter, the drone, the remote viewer, and uh, the ground movements. It's about movement, but there's a, there's a certain kind of movement on the ground that's conflicted and difficult. And there's this vision from above. And it goes back some time. I mean, it goes back clearly to the Vietnam War that, that was one of the aspects that created this kind of geography. The kind of geography which I uh, uh, admire very much was this man who was ostensibly driving a taxi after being um, exiled from the academic world with a typewriter. I love this, a completely surrealist image of a man in a, in a cab with a typewriter. And it's seeing the city, serving the city, and recording the city, which is very much what I tried to do myself right back at the start of the whole project that finished up with the last London. Uh, my, my take began really in, in the early 1970s 
when I uh, left various forms of teaching and uh, filmmaking and just taken a series of jobs across East London at street level and had time to contemplate the nature of the Hawksmoor churches and their relation to each other and the way certain buildings operated upon the movements of people, buildings that you were given access to, buildings you weren't. And I was asked um, a question, we did a short interview before this, this talk, and I was asked if there was a, an equivalent in architecture of the sort of writing that I do, and that, that stymied me completely. Because a lot of the architecture is so much to do with pastiche and quotation, and then suddenly it, it came to me that if there was a model for the whole structure of what I've done, from the speculative essays and poetry of uh, the working life as a gardener in Limehouse in 1975, through a series of Gothic novels where the Gothic element is provided by contemporary political figures, as well as uh, a looking back to the Victorian period and the huge things that went on in London then as now in the creation of the railways and the, the ripping up of whole areas of London. Um, and I thought that the, the thing was that the frontage of uh, Nicholas Hawkes Moore's Christchurch Spitalfields, because here is a structure that looks like it shouldn't work, should fall over and crush you, because it's a history. It's a history of his own obsessions with architecture. That as you move up through the building, you move through the classical into the Gothic. It's stacked on top of each other, and yet it holds. And it's obsessed people with obsessed writers. It's obsessed <coughs> architects. It has a, a bulk and a strength that, I, that triggered me to begin thinking about London in certain ways to looking at the stone itself and seeing within the blocks the fossil history is taking you right back to Portland where the quarries where the, these stones came from and how they came to be set out in London in a particular way and how the, the thing that the church now looks out at in Spitalfields Market is no longer a vegetable market, there's no longer that interzone and the grand buildings that were in front of the market have been torn down as speculative developments, but they've pastiche, they've kept the facade like a kind of quotation of virtue. If you've got this sort of Georgian quotation, this allows you to do anything you like behind it. But the church doesn't have that. And it, it was there, in a sense, to, to inspire people like the painter Leon Kossov, who, whose father was a baker, a neighborhood baker, and who grew up as a child, a Jewish child, looking at this alien structure which seemed to dominate the area and to start to sketch it right from the ground level as a towering vertical presence over it. And that goes back, as I said, this verticality. We think of the, the helicopters of the, the war, a war waged by helicopter, the noise and the invasion of the city. And in 1964, um, helicopters were brought in to survey the Lower Lee Valley, because I think, again, because of probably Phil's interests and work here with oral history and the nature of this place. I think I wanted to, to reference that as a new London, the whole Olympicopolis, as they call it, the new city there. Anyway, the Duke of Edinburgh was flown over here in a crested helicopter in 1964, I think it was. Um, he was going to give a talk at Hackney Town Hall. And uh, he, after being asked what he thought of it, he said, uh, on the whole, a pretty average mess. And from that height, you know, it was a pretty average mess. But at ground level, for the people, the various categories of people that moved through that area, the people who recovered um, very polluted, toxic ground and made allotments out of it and created uh, multicultural communities, uh, almost a little island oasis, the, the various um, Sports facilities that grew up. I used to, one of my jobs was painting 200 p football pitches, the white lines there, which was like being in some kind of wonderful Aztec community of the lines of the <laughs> desert, enormous skies, one Polish man on a tractor about half a mile away on the horizon. It's like that scene in Torn Curtain out of Hitchcock. And, and you know, what a way to, to learn about the kind of meditation of London, not knowing that um, Astrid Prohl, one of the flying, uh, hiding away Bader Meinhof group, was working just across the River Lee in the Lesney's toy factory. And she's there um, when the news came in of her 
fellow activists dying in prison in Germany. And she actually got into a car and started driving up the wrong, wrong side of the motorway. And all that was going on. And, and later being able to walk with her through, through those allotments and, and seeing how significant they were, because I, allotments in Berlin are very important. The fact of the, in East Berlin, getting, getting an allotment gave you a kind of a, a, a toehold into a kind of capitalism in that you were able to exploit and use your own allotment. So the thing that the, the Duke of Edinburgh saw as a, a pretty average mess was exactly what was repeated at the time of the Olympic moment. There was nothing there. I kept saying, there's nothing there. It's, it's all a wilderness. It's all, it's all a mess, which, it, of course, as soon as you start to examine it, it was not remotely. And in fact, um, on, on the fences that went up were hung these enormous dictionaries, and I picked one of them up, because all of the, all of the building, all of the uh, businesses, all of, all of the little factories, all of the people who were living there had to be listed in this dictionary. And it was, it was enormous, the sheer range of stuff that had been going on in this difficult landscape, but a landscape made up part of uh, poisoned land, part of rough orchards, part of uh, secrets, had, had a real magic to it, a haunting magic that existed on the frame of things. So that was something that was horizontal and it was something that could have been mapped in exactly this way. And it went against that, that verticality in exactly the same period. An unlikely person to be in a helicopter, John Betjeman was uh, flown over the Peeps estate in Deptford. And of course, um, you know, he was horrified by the, by the idea of the people in these tar books. He, he wrote a, a poem about it called The Peeps Estate. And this is a, uh, from a program, 1969, called The Englishman's Home, which was shot entirely from a helicopter. Where can be the heart that sends a family to the 20th floor in such a slab as this? It can't be right. However, the view over Greenwich and the Isle of Dogs, it can't be right. Caged halfway up the sky, not knowing your neighbour, frightened of the lift, and who'll be in it, and who's down there, and are your children safe? Well, um, who would answer that? But. Um, Someone I've done a lot of expeditionary geography with is a filmmaker and performer called Andrew Cotty, who happened to live in the Peeps estate um, round about that time, um, or a little later in fact, and who found it, it was absolutely heartbeat. It was, it was so perfectly London. He, and one of the sort of tragedies for him, in a way, was, and his wife was unforgiving about this, was at that uh, Thatcherite moment when you were encouraged to, to um, become property owners and to write to buy, you bought up this flat and that gave you the money. They had, they had a severely disabled daughter who's rather wonderful called Eden who suffered from Joubert syndrome and was born when they were living there and there was no room in this flat so they, they sold up and they, they moved out to the south coast. But nevertheless, uh, the, the sort of secret of the Samuel Pepys' estate, as an actual witness, as against this kind of a generic vision that, that Betjeman has by going over in a helicopter, I would like to read you two, just an extract from that. This is from a book I did some time back, or edited rather, called um, London City of Disappearances, because there was such a sense already that we were moving into a kind of last London, and so many things. The size of the book indicates the response to it, about people who wanted to write about things that were gone or going. And interestingly, Andrew Cotting begins his piece about the Samuel Pepys estate that he calls Just Gone, with a, a sort of nice geographical quote. He says, all cities are geological. You cannot take three steps without encountering ghosts bearing all the prestige of their legends. We move within a closed landscape whose landmarks constantly draw us towards the past. Gilles Yvain. So, here he goes, this is Cotton writing. Here he goes, here he goes. A South London paradise, head fairly full to overflowing with the cacophony from the cafe gallery to downtown, from Deptford Beach to the Lion Roars, to George Davis's Innocent, 
from Jim and Bob and John Ergen to Cash and Fred and Dorian Crook, DNC metals and Salter's pepper to the dog and bell and selling wicker furniture with Jack Sharp in Deptford Market. But now to home, the flat, red brick, yellow insides, an entrance to the rear, puddled with piss in summertime, blocked with adolescent bliss in wintertime. The lift gleams with spittle, the corridors with polish, and up on the sixth floor, the corridor, second on the left, home, their home, good to be home, home, Ben's house, Pete's estate, home. We're inside, knickknacks, bric-a-brac, give the man a phone, hugger mugger, memorabilia of their lives, lives live together, home, and then the child, sick in the head, dribbling, rocking, life will never be the same again, child, Forever at home, child, she can't walk or talk, and she drags us down into a world of loopy repetition, papa, 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 despair. We're not there to hide. We imbibe the paraphernalia that is vertical living, thousands of us shuffling and kerfuffling with our busyness and the smell of the place and the heat and the pace of the place and the spicy West Indian voices, warming, booming and echoing, rejoice, rejoice, isn't it a thing of joy to have known and to have seen the sacrosanctity of the world of God? So you've got the messianic religions, you've got the smells, you've got the, the piss in the corridor, you've got things that don't work and you have a sense of community. And you feel that against, obviously, the images that we've been seeing in the last, in the last few days. I um, mean, the horrors of one of a, an estate or a block that's not kept up, that's, that's, that's treated with the, the cheapest methods in a, in a rich borough where half the properties are empty. This, this, is, a, this is a city, you know, that, that's stretched. It stretches the imagination to think how the city is behaving and how we can survive being in it. And I think those are the problems that, that I have. Uh, and why the term psychogeography is too, uh, too theoretical in a way. It was a, a, um, a term that was very applicable to the situationists and the letterists in Paris in the 60s, and I think it migrated into London in a slightly parodic form in the 80s, in that, that moment when the society was being challenged, everything we're seeing now is beginning to form. Some of the devices of classic uh, psychogeography were mingled with the sort of English versions, more, more like the stuff I was producing by combining diaries of working life with speculations about arrangements of Hawks more churches. But what I was doing was certainly, and I didn't realize at the time, a kind of definitely a form of mapping. And the book I did, Light Heat, actually opened with a sort of fairly nutty map that was uh, loosely inspired by a book by Elizabeth Gordon, E.O. Gordon, called Prehistoric London, Its Mounds and Circles. And it was one of those weird books that I picked up when I wasn't looking for it. I'd gone into, a, into one of these um, old, slightly spiritualist bookshops, a bit, bit like Watkins or somewhere, and somebody came rushing out of the back room and said, you must read this. And it was this triangulation of forces of energy in London that, that particularly related in this to, to early prehistoric mounds. The Penton Mound and um, Parliament Hill and Tot, Tot Hill in Westminster in a sort of eccentric way. All of the things that were happening in the London of the moment and the places where poets had been born or buried, um, places where incidents had happened, it became a kind of a personal map kind of autobiographical map and also a memory map because I think geography is memory and especially over a long period of time. You learn who you are and you know who you are by the markers of the familiar things. You come down to this part of London, Bedford Square, you remember sitting in the shade of that square at some other time, going to a wedding here talking to somebody on the street there. All of, all of these memories make for a very, very rich place. And what's difficult now is that so much is imposed in this vertical way, or the computer way, where you look more, you look at a map to see what blank spaces apparently can be made into something else. There's this compulsion for an, an, an imposed narrative against the narrative that you discover or unpick or make for yourself 
from some series of journeys. Um, one, of the, one of the journeys I undertook, well, there were, there were two significant journeys with, with Andrew Cotting, who I mentioned before, who'd, who'd lived and was so ingrained in Peep's house and that version of London. What he, what he does there is a sort of Chaz and Dave version of London. It's kind of Cockney knockabout, but it's also his life, that he's, he's, um, he wants to be a filmmaker, performer, but he's actually working in market stalls, he's moving around, he's going to the gym, he's, he's going to the art gallery in Dilston Grove, all of these things inform a certain kind of excitement about the city, being in a city, being in a, um, a relatively cheap part of the city, enjoying that, enjoying all, particularly the sensory aspects of the city. And um, then he moves away from it, he's in a different place, he's in um, Hackney on Sea in Hastings. And so um, a chance to undertake kind of other journeys that would bring all these considerations in, into the argument were, were, were there to be undertaken. And one of the things we did at the time of the Olympics was, uh, I was doing this book about Hackney and I was trying to persuade him to swim around Hackney. By, <laughs> was, he's, he's an open water swimming. Um, and he's pretty mad, but that was a step too far. <laughs> so, so actually we walked, we walked the canal system and I showed him when, you know, where we would have gone on the New River or whatever. And he, did, he thought about it a bit, but he, he bottled out. Uh, but during the course of that, he said, well, okay, we could do it by swan. So he took this swan pedal from the, the Swan Lake um, fairground in Hastings, and we dragged it into the sea, and we took it along in the sea to, to Rye, and then up the River Rother, and then dragged it across land to the Medway, and then up the Medway to the Thames, and the Thames to the Olympic site. And finally the swan arrived at the emerging area. So, I mean, this is a marathon. This is a super marathon. And along the way, you meet all of these um, eccentric peoples who are hiding out, who are not part of the ordinary story, because they're, they're living on the banks of rivers. They're living between rivers and motorways. They're living on, a, on abandoned... Uh, sites where wrecked boats are left and they're kind of outside the system, they're off the grid. And he does all this and we, are, you know, we arrive finally at the Olympic site and there are now chains across the river of access. And there are helicopters, of course, helicopters overhead, please get that sworn away. <laughs> well, so at the, at week, the weekend I kind of, I wanted to give this Park, you know, we said, well, let's it's, let's let's see what emerges. You know, I, I've been satirical, I've been uh, critical of what I thought it was at the time. A few years have passed. What is it now? Well, uh, so okay, I, I took a whole family, grandchildren, everything back to this park to see if there was anything for any of them in it. And it, it seemed now to have become a, a kind of drive-through motorway. Basically, it was a sort of a, a retail park. Uh, rather than a, a pleasure park in any sense, with, with these in, um, strange collection of imposed buildings. But worst of all, in front of the aquatic centre was now a rank of swan peddlers. <laughs> 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 and you had to pay to get, get my two grandchildren and wife onto this thing, £22. <laughs> and you were only allowed to go about as far as the end of this room and there's a white boy, and if you went further, the helicopters and, and sirens. <laughs> and I thought, this is, this is some horrible irony is happening here. This is, you know, this is, this is the end of the world. Uh, because you can't be subversive, you know. Whatever you do, it turns into a promotion. Someone picks it up. And even at the time we did it, I remember, we were talking about it somewhere, and, and a kind of guy in a suit rather sort of whispered up, do you mind if, if I could buy that swan? I, I, I want to put it on the, by three mils, and I'm going to charge people, you know, so, no, it had to go back to where it came from, it's, it's down there, you can go on it, it's in, it's in the paddling pool in Hastings now, number 19, <laughs> <laughs> take, take it out. But um, the continuation of this, this project was another of these expeditionary geographies, but it's also a kind of a engagement with history, uh, true or false, and it, it happened at the moment, just, just immediately before the, the Brexit vote, when there'd been a commission in Hastings to, to do something about King Harold and the Battle of Hastings, and that kind of invasion from Europe 
seemed to be the right moment to uh, walk from Waltham Abbey, where he'd, uh, he had associations with Waltham Abbey. He'd been cured there as a young man. He stopped there on the way down from the Battle of Stamford Hill to fight the Battle of, uh, at Battle, the Battle of Hastings. And so we followed his route, um, a group of people, musicians, and a singer called Claudia Barton, Jem Finer, one of the Pogues, and uh, the drummer, and all, all this random bunch wandered down through from Waltham Abbey, down past the Olympic site, and on all the way down to Hastings. Uh, and what happened, you know, essentially was that we realised, uh, as this was going on, even though London was still in one mindset, as soon as you passed into South London and across the border of the uh, M25, the signs, the sign, the huge signs for vote leave were coming in strong. And, we and also, the attitude towards this random ragbag bunch of troubadours marching down the drums was getting quite stern. In, in, um, in Tunbridge, it turned quite nasty. And I, I took a photograph of one of these signs and a huge kind of pot-bellied guy came roaring out and, you know, so, you know, but I, you know, sort of, well, well, if it's not an advert, what is it? You know, what do you do with a sign? You know, a sign is about something. Anyway, that's by the by. But um, I realised then, passing the Olympic site, that it, it had become, it had become very much the symbol of, of, of where we're at, in that the story imposed from above, the, the helicopter story, is of something that is um, opening up endless new possibilities for London. There are these stadia, there is the uh, huge Westfield Mall, and there's this massive road through it. But also then it became for me a loop of memory in terms of having to think about the, the, how that landscape had been in the past, and equally right back at, to the very first book, which was um, a much wilder book, this Blood Heat book, because it finished when I'd, I'd just given up being a gardener, and I got the impulse, for some uh, reason, I'm not sure what, to run just out of the door one night in the, in the rain at the end of having written, finished the writing, um, to just see where I went. And, I, and it, it took me through Victoria Park, and I finished up right by a concrete pillbox on the, on the River Lee. And that seemed to be a kind of oracular structure in some way. There had to be a voice hidden in this pillbox. So I'd run to there and I'd got very excited by a sort of eight-sided concrete pillbox that had survived. And now I realised that this marked the, the exact point of the Olympic Stadium. It was just looking straight at it. So in the piece, I'll just read a little section from this when I re-encounter this Olympic landscape and see how it is now. I return by way of Stratford International, which involves, no, sorry, that's, uh, that, I'll leave that for a moment, so that's the wrong bit, that's um, Olympic Park, yep. The Olympic Park is a game reserve, lacking beasts as yet, but awe-inspiring in its privileged emptiness. Miles of unoccupied concrete floor at here east, enough for regiments of rough sleepers, helicopters overhead, flight path tourism, Downward staring surveillance cameras, postmodern design features, black and corvine on the rim of generic hangars. Beyond some lazy golf cart security, there is nobody about. On a pre rusted steel overpass, two young Chinese women in Santa Claus outfits are arguing over the coolest backdrop for a selfie. The borders of the park are trimmed in orange. Construction is a career like no other. Rectangular tubs of spidery grasses are reflected deep into the darkness of blandly sinister buildings. Cycle lanes have been cancelled for upgrades. Pedestrians are ordered to stand back to allow this morning's Dane Kelly Holmes charity half marathon to thread through interweaving levels of road, pedestrian paths and canal. Flagging runners are encouraged by men dressed as bears, turning up the sound for Eartha Kitt's Santa Baby. Yuletide favourites boom out over the bitumen meadows, the stream of cars heading to Westfield, the emerging crop of investment flats, the red cranes, the anvil dunes of remediated soil, the shuttered concession stalls, 
the scarlet and so metal orbit with its viewing platform and its screaming silver tubes. And this vision, the blighted Eden, the radiant hub, was awe-inspiring in the style of a cross-section diagram in an improving boys' comic from my childhood in the 1950s, a canal with cyclists and joggers, scattered statement buildings too new to be used, polished roads, retail village, casino, breakfast bars, residential towers, muck heaps, public art, <coughs> perpetual construction, helicopters, drones, shuffling trains, and huge skies. But the sight that had me laughing out loud was this rank of pristine swan peddlers parked on the stretch of the river straying straight to Westfield. The entire working model for this regeneration project the helter-skelter, the swan pedal awry, was just a straight steal from the Flamingo Amusement Park in Hastings. I ran. I barged through the ribbons of red and blue tape, shrugging off patronizing hugs reserved for the charitable athletes who had made it to the line. I escaped, and I found myself catching up with earlier identities, with adventures on the northern sewage outflow, the improved, cycle-friendly greenway heading towards Victoria Park which now more than ever felt like a proper park, an oasis, a green lung. I finished exactly where I found myself 42 years ago at the start of my theoretical London project when I ran the oracle for a self-published book called Blood Heat. No word other than the need for it. I came up against a wartime relic, a six-sided concrete pillbox, a pissy shrine guarding the River Lee, close to the point where the old Roman road made its original ford, and all those intervening years had brought me was a better class of confusion, obfuscation and error, a misreading of signs and symbols. I stopped. The pillbox was intact and improved. It survived beyond blocks of exposed flats and the London Stadium, that great Death Star, on the wall beside the bridge, someone had sprayed a simple naked plea, help me. I looked through one of the machine gun slats on a pillar. In the concrete core of the bunker was the outline of a ghostly figure drawn in chalk. This was King Lud as a green man, and a phallic stake had been driven through his cheating heart. <sighs> My uh, inspiration at the time of William Bungie uh, was someone of the same kind of size and scale, and I think the same kind of physical difficulties, because this, he was, a, he was a, clearly a, 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 a complex and challenging and in-your-face personality, um, and so was the poet Charles Olson, who was about six foot seven or eight, very, very big, very demanding, and who gave a, a lengthy, endless talk and reading at Berkeley at the same sort of time as a lot of the, the geographical uh, engagements were going on. And Olson himself uh, called himself the archaeologist of mourning. He, he wanted to um, push back the, the, the boundaries of what, what cultural interest should be way, way beyond what um, someone like Ezra Pound had done in the counters. And he, he took, got himself off to Yucatan and spent a long time there um, picking through shards and, and um, creating a book of the let Mayan letters which he wrote to fellow poet Robert Creeley. So I th I mean, there's a very much a kind of parallel there in, in, in slightly different worlds. That, that geography, land and space and those kind of ideas, uh, settlement, immigration, Using, using evidence, use, how to use evidence, how to go, how to research, how to find out about the, the shipping industries in Gloucester, Massachusetts, how to find about the investment in settlement that made that town what it is, how to find out how it was now being destroyed in, in various ways by different kinds of developments, different kinds of roads that were coming, all, all of that stuff. Um, and Olson, uh, one of his large pictures was this idea of open field poetics or open field composition, which goes against the whole idea of the enclosures, the whole Olympic Park idea, and the whole idea of a lot of construction now around London and elsewhere is, is the fence, 
the blue fence that goes up, that kind of masks the story. It, you know, I noticed it for the very first time on the line into the, into the Thames estuary. I was wondering at the time of the Olympics, when you, when you took a train down to someone like, someone like Rain and Marshes, you know, huge landfill sites, how that would play with the kind of dignitaries who were being shown this landscape. And how it played was they just put up fences to mask the worst horror. So you had a kind of fairground ride with a lot of stuff hidden, the idea of the hidden, the enclosed, and played with the interest of some of those poets in, in going back to the English so-called peasant poet John Clare, who uh, was active at the time of enclosure of common land in his village north of Peterborough, and who was so deeply disturbed, again, in the memory geography, that the landscape of his own mind and his own psyche was, was being taken away from him. He was being exiled from his own ground, and that was incredibly painful as well as coming to London and having to perform as himself, to perform as a celebrity poet, and to be a kind of amusing and interesting eccentric, was, was devastating. So he ends up in an asylum in Lippitz Hill in High Beach, in the edge of Epping Forest, which is now exactly where the police helicopter come from. They're, they're within 50 yards of John Clare's asylum. So the, 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 the whole patterns and pictures of London feeds itself into this structure. And to understand something of Bungie, I, I, I mean, he was born in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And I don't know anything, really, about Wisconsin. So I began to think about what I did know about Wisconsin and realized that this parallel to, um, Senator Joe McCarthy came from there. And his uh, closest associate, you know, in the prosecution of uh, un-American activities and communism in the armed forces and the academic profession was a man called Roy Cohen, who became the mentor to Donald Trump in the 1970s. So there are interesting kind of parallels and conflicts going on here in Wisconsin, just at a quick sketch through. And in the same place in La Crosse, you had two um, leftist filmmakers, both, uh, both of whom were, were challenged in various ways by McCarthy's activities. Joseph Losey and, and Nick Ray, and um, Losey became an associate of Bertolt Brecht in Hollywood, and, and eventually came to London, where he was able to make films under an assumed name. So, you know, it was, it was beneficial to English culture, London culture, that these guys were exiled from this place, Wisconsin. But oh, that's that's sketchy. But I applied my own um, scavenging methods to Wisconsin. In the same, same way that uh, W.G. Zabel, who I've, I've written about in uh, Last London, I've followed the, the, the trails of Austerlitz, that book in particular, because he, he was led through that part of East London by the poet Stephen Watts. And I, I went through uh, with Stephen and redid, redid a lot of those journeys and talked about the memories of Zabel. And they talked about, um, Stephen told me how they used to pick up postcards in Spitalfields Market and um, use, often use these postcards to simulate a fiction. He would build up a story around a, a character and then drop it in as evidence, as if this was something that had emerged from some completely other source. But it's, it's just found footage, scavenging. So when I went to scavenging, I found a, a map of a postcard with Wisconsin on, perfect. And then, you know, much more than that, it's, 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 a, it's one of these maps that that kind of, uh, when you look at them closely, is, is a completely propagandist vision of what Wisconsin actually is, as the, uh, what, it, what does it call itself, um, the, the state bird of Robin. And it's got on it, and I really look closer, that the person who sent the card, and the card is sent back to Ilford in Essex. I was almost tempted to walk out immediately to find this address and talk to these people. This is from 1976. Uh, it says, uh, Wisconsin, nickname Badger State. And he's written on the front, 800 miles long, 400 miles wide in Byron Bottom. And at the top, when you look closely, it says Iron Mountain, Michigan. And then there's a series of lines and, and pauses and stops that tell you about this journey he'd made and my
struggled to interpret it, but I finally read his card, and it was really quite interesting. He says, um, this is Monday, 26th of February, 1979. Greetings from Wisconsin. Finally, pen to paper. Today I fly from Madison, change at Milwaukee, then on to Green Bay, where I change again for Iron Mountain, Michigan. I will return tomorrow, and all this for one hour's presentation. I've marked the location. I thought this rang a bell for me. You know, I've done, I've done these journeys for one hour presentations. And you could, you could make it up. And then I looked closely at what, what's on the map, and it was um, Wisconsin presented itself as hunting, cabbage, state bird robin, cheese, dairying, cranberries, cattle, tires, horses, honey, shoes, peas, fish, Menominee Indian Reservation, winter resorts, sawmilling, maple syrup, Indian ceremonials, sweet corn, hay, shipping, and golf. Uh, the only uh, significant person who'd been born there and recorded is the home of Hercules Dousman. I don't know who he is, but <laughs> you could check. But, you know, in a sense, here you go, using these sort of scavenging methods, thinking of somebody in a place and a kind of story emerges and I, you, know, you, could, you could follow up with that. Who was this person? Why was he going to Iron Mountain, Michigan? I love the idea of someone who makes hand-drawn maps. He intervenes in the map against the propaganda of the map and tells his own story because that reminded me so much of the, uh, the Whitechapel hermit, um, David Rudinsky, who, who lived in, above a synagogue in Princelet Street, apparently all on his own, but actually as Rachel Lichtenstein, who researched it, found uh, with, a, with an entire family in a, in a very small space. Um, and then the mother died and the, the, his sister, who seems to be the really intelligent person in the family, was put into Claybury Asylum. But what was left behind amongst lots and lots of strange books was uh, an A to Z, a London A to Z. And this A to Z was annotated and had a series of quite strange journeys marked out in red by her. So at the time uh, of doing a book with Rachel about that, I took this A to Z and I walked those maps, I walked each of these strange journeys, which made no sense in terms of anything that we knew about it. And one of them led to Dagenham. And I, when I walked that, I mean, you know, firstly you get this extraordinary sense of how Dagenham is as this community that is dispersed from London. And then secondly, discovering that he had been sent out there as a nine-year-old child to live with a particular family. And he mapped his, this series of lines on this faded A to Z was this guy's um, history of himself, a diary through, through a, an annotated map. And there was another map around central London and um, so on and so on. And each of these maps told a story of a chapter that was not known about this man until he did that. And it all fed in, and that kind of exercise combined um, geography, history, memory, um, fiction, literary fiction, poetic, the, the sense of the mysteries of the room became one sort of writing, but Rachel Lichtenstein, who was incredibly determined, traced out the human story beneath it all, a story of dispersal in the 1960s, how the Orthodox Jewish community was broken up, um, I mean, at the, the poorest ones, and the remnants of people were defined as being um, mad and were sent out to asylums in places like Epsom. Um, and, you know, finally he dies out there unrecorded and is put in a pauper's grave again up near Waltham Abbey. So, by pursuing this, just the one story of this one man, through the scraps of books and records and old maps that he's dealt with, you actually have a social picture of what was happening at that time and in this period and in this city. And uh, for Rachel's methods are largely to do with her human sympathies and being able to make a lot of oral recordings. My methods are to do with undertaking curious sort of detective-like walks, teasing out stories, outside the main methods of research and, and uh, <coughs> outside the sort of essential archival library system, 
you can still make these engagements. But it's very interesting at the end of it to be brought inside and to be able to make this kind of presentation. I'll finish there. Well, I'll just finish here. I mentioned Charles Olson because thinking about this, I, I looked at uh, one of the journals that's emerged from his work and the sorcerer, the Trois Frères, uh, cave drawing of this creature and a statement of Olson's about um, space and his work, which seemed to be what I, exactly what I was trying to do myself in, in attempting to write about the city in this way. I knew no more than what I did, than to put down space and fact and hope by the act of sympathetic magic that words are able to seem when one first uses them. And I would invoke for others those sensations of life I was a small witness to and a part doer of. But the act of writing the book added a third noun, equally abstract, stance. For after it was done, and other work in verse followed, I discovered that the fact of this space located a man differently in respect to any act, so much so, and with such vexation, that only in verse did I acquire the assurance that the stance was not in some way idiosyncratic, an only sign of the limits of my own talent, only wretched evidence of the lack of my own engagement at the heart of life and the heart of the city. Thank you.